Okay, here's a diagram of a wheel that starts at rest, and you're trying to roll it up a curb with the height of h. In fact, in this example, we'll say the height of the curb is 8 centimeters, and let's say that the radius, the length of any of these spokes, is 40 centimeter. So your attempt to make it roll up the curb goes like this. You maybe have a, a string or a rope or something that you attach to the uh, axle and you pull horizontally with a force of F. So think about all the forces that are involved besides that applied force. There's a force of gravity that pulls down acting at the center of mass. There's also a couple of uh, normal forces, contact force. So the wheel contacts the ground here. So there's going to be some upward normal force. And then there's another normal force that acts right at this point of contact. Maybe that points upward and inward. Maybe it points more. That one I'm not sure the exact direction that it points. But then again, if I consider this to be my axis of rotation, then it doesn't really matter what that force is because that force would be non-torque producing if it's located right at the axis. And then again, if the whole point is I'm trying to roll this up the curb, as soon as I make this force big enough, if this force is just big enough, so I'll call this F minimum, it's the minimum required force to get it to start to roll up, then the wheel is going to lose contact with the ground and this force goes away. So I have a more simplified diagram here of the exact same situation, and all we really need to consider are these two torque producing forces. The applied force has a lever arm that goes from the hub of the wheel to the point of contact, the corner of the curb, which we'll call that lever arm R. Actually, maybe we should call it capital R in this case since it's nothing more than the radius of the wheel. And then we have a force of gravity acting this way, and it has the exact same lever arm, right? The lever arm for the applied force and the lever arm for the force vector mg are the same lever arm. The applied force F tends to make this wheel want to rotate clockwise about this axis, whereas the force mg tends to make the system want to rotate counterclockwise. So if we're solving for the minimum required force, if it's just big enough to get it to start to climb up, then we're finding the minimum force for which um, the torques are balanced. See, another way to state this condition for rotational equilibrium that says the sum of all external torque equals zero. The, an equivalent statement would be the sum of all clockwise torque is just as large in magnitude as the sum of all counterclockwise torque. And then in that case, it's, it's a battle. It's like a tug of war with no winner, okay? So if uh, those two torques are equivalent, then you'd be pulling with just the minimum required amount of force. Now, if the applied force is any greater, then the clockwise torque exceeds the counterclockwise torque and it rolls. So let's find the condition for which these torques are equal, and then we'll describe that as being the minimum required force. Okay, so our clockwise torque is, well, torque is always the cross product of lever arm with force. Our counterclockwise torque, well, that's also lever arm cross product with force. In this case, the force is mg. So we have r times f applied times, now let's be careful here. I need to identify an angle. So let's say the angle is described as this angle theta. Then the angle between the applied force and the lever arm must be 90 minus theta. Okay, so in general, torque is lever arm times force times the sine of the angle between those two, and in this case that would be the sine of 90 minus theta. Lever arm times force, times the sine of, and then the angle between mg and the lever arm is just the angle theta. So another way of saying sine of 90 minus theta would be cosine theta. If 
we cancel the R on both sides, then in statement number four, we can say F cosine theta is equal to MG sine theta, which gives us step number five, F minimum must be equal to mg tangent theta. All right, now let's provide some more numerical values. Let's say that the wheel in question here has a um, mass of two kilogram. So really, what is this minimum required force? Let's see, we've got m is two kilogram. We can round up and say g is roughly 10 meters per second per second, or 10 meter per second squared, or maybe even better yet, 10 newtons per kilogram. But this one, tangent theta, we don't exactly know the angle, but we could figure it out. Let's take a close look, see if we can find a right triangle. Oh, not too hard. There we go. We've got a right triangle here. Let's copy that. So we've got an angle theta. We've got a hypotenuse of R. And then let's see. This distance is nothing more than the radius of the wheel. This distance is the height of our curb. So this side of the triangle would be the difference between those. This would be r minus h. So then based on the Pythagorean theorem, the missing side would have to be r squared minus the quantity r minus h squared. That's the same thing as the square root of r squared minus r squared minus 2hr plus h squared. Let's see, that's the same thing as the square root of 2hr minus h squared. Oh, okay, fine. Better yet here. This is what I want to call it. The square root of h times the quantity 2r minus h. So that's the opposite side to this angle theta. r minus h is the adjacent side. So tangent theta is equal to opposite over adjacent. So it's equal to the square root of h times the quantity 2r minus h divided by adjacent, opposite, adjacent. So let's plug in and see what we get. In our example, the minimum required force would be 2 kilograms times 10 newtons per kilogram times the square root of, I think we agreed that H is 8 centimeters. R was, did we say? 40 centimeters. So we need to do 2R, that would be 80 minus h, so minus 8, divided by r minus h, 40 minus 8. So this part's easy. The kilograms cancel out. 2 times 10 gives us 20. So we have 20 newtons times the square root of 8 times 72, all divided by 32. Let's see. That's equivalent to 20 newtons times, well, oh, this reduces to 24 over 32, which is the same thing as 3 fourths, or 0 0.75. So we end up finding that the minimum required force is 15 newtons. And careful, I left out the units here. This would have been 8 centimeters times 72 centimeters, and in the denominator, 32 centimeters. And so this gave us uh, some num the square root of, I believe it was 576 centimeters squared, divided by 32 centimeters. 
So when I took the square root of 576 centimeters squared, that's where 24 centimeters came from, 32 centimeters. So the centimeters canceled out, which is why I didn't have to convert it and say 8 centimeters is 0.08 meter. I can work in units of meters or centimeters as long as the units ultimately cancel out. So there we have it, 15 newtons of applied force. Just our first example of applying the condition for rotational equilibrium.